we begin the sermon, let's pray. Lord, help us to listen. Help us to hear you. To trust you. Help us to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I explained last Sunday, on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock, I'm leading a, leading a class here in the sanctuary called Confronting the Controversies. And in this class, we discuss some of the most challenging issues in our culture. In the past three weeks, we have discussed the separation of church and state, creation and evolution, and the death penalty. In the weeks to come, we'll talk about euthanasia, prayer in public schools, abortion, and homosexuality. Everyone is invited, and I hope you can make it. As you might imagine, we've had some very interesting discussions in our classes. One of the things we found is that when dealing with difficult issues, easy answers are hard to find. That's what makes them difficult issues, right? Questions of morality often spark debate in our culture. Is a particular act right or wrong? How should we live? How do you discern right from wrong? What moral compass do you use? Have you ever used a compass? A compass, like you see in the picture there, has a needle that always points north. No matter which way you're facing or which way you're going, the needle always points north so you can always tell which way north is, no matter what direction you're going. Do you have a moral compass? A way to tell which way you're going morally. Well, what moral compasses do we have to use? What options do we have? Well, as the first note on the note sheet says, for many people, their primary moral compass is public opinion. Public opinion. They just go along with whatever the majority in society says. They basically give in to peer pressure on a national scale. I'm amazed at how often public opinion polls are reported in the news. Have you noticed that? As if that was news. I mean, they're constantly, every day I hear some sort of opinion poll. We want to know how many people think this is right or how many people think that is wrong, that is wrong as if knowing which way the majority of people are leaning will tell us what is right or wrong. And I think part of this impulse has to do with something that's deep within most humans, maybe not all, but I think most people have a deep psychological desire to belong. We all want to belong. No one wants to feel like that you're left out. But just because a majority of people think something is right or wrong doesn't necessarily mean that it is. There was a time in both European and American history during which the majority of people thought slavery was perfectly morally acceptable. Well, that doesn't mean slavery was right. There was a time before and during the early years of World War II that a majority of Germans supported Hitler and his policies. That doesn't mean Hitler was right. Apostle Paul, writing in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, tells us this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Public opinion is simply not a good moral compass. 
Other people try to use reason as their moral guide. They depend on their powers of reason, logic, and rationality. When trying to decide whether or not something is right or wrong, they try to think things through, weigh the pros and cons, and choose the direction that, to them, makes the most sense. If someone gives them a moral command, they won't follow it unless it seems reasonable to them. And it doesn't matter whether that command came from their parents or whether that command came from God. If the moral law doesn't make sense to them, well, they just reject it. Part of the problem with using reason alone as a moral compass is that we're not all-knowing. We don't know everything, so we're never able to consider all of the facts when we're trying to make our reasonable decision. Also, we can be wrong. We can be honestly, sincerely wrong. How many of you took advanced math classes in either high school or college? Yeah, do you remember that? You can see that look of, oh my goodness. And some of you loved it, probably. Did you ever, ever have a situation when you were doing your best to work out one of those advanced math problems and you were doing so as best you could according to the laws of mathematics as had been taught to you by your teacher and yet still the answer wasn't right? Did that ever happen to you? Or am I the only one that happened to you? And you're thinking, how can that be wrong? You know, when the test comes back, you say, no, that was the wrong answer. You're going, whoa, 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 wait a second. No, I followed this step, this step. I went through it just the way I was supposed to. Still got the wrong answer. Well, if you get a wrong answer on a math test, it might hurt your grade. But if you choose the wrong path morally, the results could be da disastrous. And just like we can be wrong in figuring through our logic in mathematics, we can be wrong in our logic and reason and rationality when thinking through moral questions. Proverbs 16.25 tells us this, some people think they're doing right, but in the end, it leads to death. They think they're doing right, but in the end, it leads to death. So human reason alone is not an adequate moral compass. Some people try to build their understanding of morality on the basis of experience. They look at their own life and the lives of others and ask, well, how did their decisions turn out? Did it work out well or not? I guess you could say it's the pragmatic approach to moral discernment. If a moral position appears to generate positive outcomes, then it's declared good. It must have been a good decision. One of the ways we see this currently playing out in our culture is the claims that gay parents are really good at raising children to be caring, responsible, successful members of society. I've seen this argument presented from three different sources in just the past couple of months. The argument goes that if gay parents can raise good kids, then homosexual marriages must be morally good. But that's not necessarily so. For example, in the Old Testament, we read of how Solomon, the son of King David, grew to be not only king, but recognized as perhaps the wisest man who ever lived. Solomon was also extremely wealthy and reigned over one of the most peaceful periods in Israel's history. From an earthly perspective, Solomon was very successful. But you might remember that Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. And you might also remember that David and Bathsheba were married 
after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband. But since David and Bathsheba produced a son like Solomon, doesn't that mean that God obviously brought David and Bathsheba together and approved of their marriage? If you remember the story of David, you'll remember that God was very angry with David for taking Bathsheba as he did. And God punished him for it. Even though Solomon enjoyed a great deal of earthly success, even though he was the kind of son that many people would have been proud to have, that does not mean that the relationship of his parents was what God wanted. Likewise, even though some children of gay parents are really good kids, that doesn't mean that the relationship of their parents is what God wants. I'm just using that particular issue as an example. But the larger idea is this. Just because a decision results in positive outcomes, it does not necessarily mean that the decision was morally right. Or, to put it another way, the end does not justify the means. Jesus put it this way. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, Jesus said, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? A person may be very successful from an earthly perspective and yet still completely miss out on who God is and on what God desires for them. So, the pragmatic observation of experience alone does not serve as an adequate moral compass. It is not enough to simply ask, how did that decision turn out? Many people discern right from wrong primarily on the basis of their own desires. I think that's what it comes down to for most Americans. They discern right from wrong primarily on the basis of their own desires. If I want it bad enough, if I feel it deep enough in my heart, then it must be right. Over the years, I've had several conversations with spouses who were committing adultery and chose to leave their wife or their husband. And even if you point out what Scripture has to say about adultery, one of the things that they typically say is, but it feels so right. I've even had them say, I think God understands, because it feels so right. And in thinking that way, they're just following the predominant mindset of the surrounding culture. Our culture is immersed in this, uh, this paradigm of follow your desires. So many of our movies and songs and other popular media are built around the theme of follow your heart. You said, you like the way I said that? Follow your heart. And the reason I said it that way, follow your heart, is because the way it's presented, it's almost like it's a noble thing. If you ignore what everybody else is saying, you ignore what your parents say, you ignore what your friends say, you ignore what God says, and you just follow your heart. And there's something noble about that pursuit. Really? Follow your heart. Or sometimes you, you hear it put this way, follow your dream. I really enjoy Disney movies. Especially now that, you know, I have a little girl, we're watching a lot more Disney movies. But almost every Disney movie, can be boiled down to the same thing. Follow your dream. Follow your dream. It's like, okay, gee, I've never heard that one before. It's the same plot line over and over. Almost, almost, not quite, but almost every Broadway musical I've ever seen comes down to follow your dream. Well, there's a problem with that, with that whole uh, mantra of follow your heart, follow your dream. The problem is, is that the human heart is not always a reliable guide. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, God says this to the prophet Jeremiah, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and 
desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. You'll notice he said according to what their actions deserve. He doesn't say according to what their feelings deserve. But Lord, it felt so right. But the action was still immoral. It's not wrong to have desires. That's part of being human. But our problem is that we far too easily desire the wrong things. So our desires in and of themselves do not provide an adequate moral compass. Despite what almost everything else in our culture is telling you, it is not enough to just follow your heart. So, in regard to moral guidance, if we can't depend on public opinion or reason and logic or experience or even on our own feelings and desires, then what, what, what can we depend on? There is another compass we may choose to follow, the Word of God. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is page 437 in the Bibles in the Pews. Psalm 119 That's such a good sound the sound of Bible pages being turned Psalm 119 let's begin in verse 9 How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word I seek you with all my heart do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 writes this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. So I guess it just comes down to um, read the Bible and do what it says, right? Well, that sounds easy enough. Is it that easy? Is it that simple? Unfortunately, it's not always that simple. Even when you're trying to do just that, I just, want to, I just want to read the Bible, I just want to listen to what the Lord has to say and just obey. Well, sometimes it's not all the, always that easy. Some passages are hard to understand. In the, our discussion the other night on the death penalty, one of the things that we recognized is, you know, depending on which passages of Scripture you go to, you know, there's some passages that would seem to support the death penalty, then there's other passages that would make you question it. And so it's a challenging thing. This isn't, even though there are a lot of things in here simple enough for a child to understand, this is not primarily intended to be a child's book. As C.S. Lewis once, once said, God wants his followers to have child's, uh, children's hearts but grown-ups' heads. It's not always easy, is it? Two people can read the same biblical passage and come away with two very different interpretations of what it means, right? 
I've heard it said that where you have two Baptists, you have at least three opinions. It's true. And if you form a committee, they'll come up with 25 more opinions. Two different people can read the same passage and come up with two totally different interpretations. Why is that? Why is it that when you look at Scripture and when I look at Scripture, we don't always necessarily see the same thing? Here's why. When each one of us reads the Bible, we read it through our own lens of understanding. And that understanding is colored by our own prejudices, ignorance, Education, hopes, fears, experiences, psychological temperament, just the way our personality is constructed, and our cultural conditioning. The culture we've been soaking in has a huge role in how we read the Bible. So when you read the Bible, you never just read it for what the Bible says. You read it through the lens of you. I read it through the lens of me. And, and you can't avoid it. You can't say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to read the Bible just for what it says. No, because of the way humans are constructed, <laughs> we always read from a particular perspective. We always read carrying baggage. So what do you do? This is why it is so important that we read and interpret the Bible in the context of our Christian community. In conversation with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are living now and with those who have long since gone on to, the, gone on to glory. We need to listen to the larger conversation of what the entire body of Christ has been saying about this particular issue or how the entire body of Christ has wrestled with this particular passage, not just over the past 10 years or 20 years, but over the past 100, 500, 1,000, 2,000 years. It's a long conversation, folks. And if you have a question about a particular passage or several passages of the Scripture, I can almost guarantee you that you're not the only one that's asked those questions. You're not the only one that's wrestled with it. And what happens is, is that as we listen, as we become part of the larger conversation, our different perspectives can help us to balance each other and keep any one of us from just going out in left field. Do you know it's possible for a well-intentioned person, if they become isolated from the rest of their brothers and sisters in Christ or in too small of a theological gene pool, it's possible to grasp some pretty outlandish ideas. You see it all the time. Sometimes it even makes headlines. That people, they get these ideas and man, they just run with it. And if they had just paid more attention listening to the wider conversation happening throughout the entire body of Christ, maybe they would have thought, eh, maybe I need to hold off on that. Maybe I need to rethink that. As we read the Bible in conversation with the body of Christ, with our brothers and sisters, we need to remember we're not on our own. The Holy Spirit who dwells within us guides us as we try to understand the Word of God together. Jesus said in John 14, He said, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And we know that the Holy Spirit has been sent. We read in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been sent. So the time Jesus spoke of has happened. In John chapter 16, Jesus says, But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will lead you into all truth. He will not speak His own words, but He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is to come. So, as we read the Word of God in the context of Christian community, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit... God gives us a reliable moral compass. We've been talking about how to discern right from wrong. What's your compass? 
What's your compass? How do you tell right from wrong? I've mentioned several different compasses we might use. Public opinion, reason, experience, desires, the Word of God. I broke these down into separate components to help us understand them. But in actual practice, we usually don't use any single compass to discern right from wrong. Most of the time, we'll use several or even all of these compasses at once to determine moral truth. We'll apply reason to an issue and weigh our experiences and consider our desires and bend an ear to public opinion. And we'll also try to remember what the Bible says about the matter. But here's the big question. Which compass carries the most weight in your life. As you make moral decisions, on which compass do you most lean or depend? Now one might expect, well, well of course Christians. Christians, of course, primarily lean on the Bible. They primarily lean on the Word of God. But I have talked with so many Christians over the years who when it came right down to it, gave other compasses much more influence in their lives than they did the Word of God. This is especially so when one is faced with a command from God to do this or a command to not do that, and God's command goes against what that Christian really wants to do or goes against what that Christian really wants to believe, what they want to to be true. We'll use reason to rationalize why we can ignore God's word in this particular case. Or we'll opt for what seems to be the most pragmatic course of action based on our experiences. Or we'll just go ahead and give in to our desires hoping that God will understand. Or we'll just sidestep the whole thing and play it safe by trying to just cave into public opinion. Just go with the crowd. What do you do when God tells you something that you don't really want to hear? Has God ever done that with you? Has God ever told you something that you didn't want to hear? I want to tell you a story that I've told, I've told you uh, several times before, at least in a couple other sermons over the years, but I keep coming back to it because I love the story. I think it really illustrates things well. Several years ago, um, my niece, Lauren, back when she was about four or five years old, one day she and her dad, Mark, and I went out to the store together. And after we got what we needed in the store, we were back out in the parking lot, sat there in the car, and Mark looked back at Lauren, who was sitting in her booster seat, and he asked her to put her seatbelt on. She refused. He asked her again. She said she didn't want to. Mark tried to explain why it's important that we wear seat belts when we ride in cars, but you know, just seemed right over her head. Didn't connect. He turned around, reached in the back seat, and put it on for her. As soon as he turned back around and sat down in the driver's seat, what do you think she did? She took it right off. Then he firmly commanded her to put that seatbelt on or we weren't leaving the parking lot. She didn't move. I'm looking at my watch thinking, we may be sitting here a while. Finally, parents, do you ever get to that point where you're just done? <laughs> Finally, he threatened to punish her in a big way if she didn't put that seatbelt on. Lauren gritted her teeth. She put that seatbelt on. And for a moment, there was just silence in that car. Then, speaking just loudly enough so that we could hear her, Lauren said, I wish I had a different daddy. 
That's what you want to hear. I glanced, uh, you know, out of the corner of my eye, I glanced over at my brother-in-law, and, and he was just sitting there, bless his heart. He had that, that worn-out parent look, you know. He was just sitting there like, I'm doing the best I can. Bless his heart. You know, the ironic thing in this was that in making her put her seatbelt on, Mark was doing the most loving thing for her at that moment, even though she didn't understand it, even though it wasn't what she wanted, and even though it didn't feel like love to her. It was love. It was love. When God tells us to do something that we really don't want to do, when God says something to us that we really don't want to hear, what do we do? When I'm in that situation, and I have been very blessed to have been in that situation many times and even continue to be on occasion. It's wonderful. I expect many more times before I'm through with this earthly journey. God's going to tell me all sorts of things that I'd really rather not hear. So what do I do? Well, I try to remember some key truths. And it's not rocket science. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to figure this one out. Here it is. God knows more than I do. What a revelation, right? Duh. God knows more than I do. God is wiser than I am. God knows the future, and I don't. He knows what's coming down the track. I don't. God knows what's best for me far better than I do. Just like Mark, as an adult, knew far better what was, be what was best for Lauren as a four or five year old. God, who, in case you didn't know this, the distance between God's wisdom and ours is a lot farther than the distance between the wisdom of an adult and a four year old. God knows what's best for us far better than we do. When I'm in that situation where I'm struggling with it, I try to remember that truth is not determined by public opinion. I don't think God pays attention to public opinion polls. I try to remember that truth is larger than my logic. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. So, Kevin, is your logic the measure by which the universe is assessed? Who do I think I am? I try to remember that truth is not limited to my experience. I try to remember that truth is not determined by my desires. It doesn't matter how strongly I feel it. It doesn't mean it's true. I try to remember these things, and then, here's the word, guys, and then I'm about to say a bad word in American culture. You ready for this? I try to remember these things, and then submit. Oh, we don't like to submit, do we? We hate that word in American culture. I try to submit to the Word of God. I try. I don't always get it right. I try to listen, trust, and obey. Has God been trying to tell you something lately that you don't want to hear? What moral decisions are you facing? Which moral compass are you primarily depending on? During the invitation, if you need to talk or pray with somebody, I'll be standing at the front. The associate pastors will be standing on the other side. But as it is with most all of our invitations, what it comes down to for all of us, myself included, is are we willing, do we have the courage to listen to what God's saying?
do we trust him enough that he really knows better than we do what's best for us? Are we willing to listen, trust, and obey? Would you stand?